Good evening, virtual audience, and welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Hilary Carr, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm very pleased to introduce this event with Rebecca Roanhorse presenting her new novel, Fevered Star, joined in conversation by G.R. McAllister. Thank you for joining us tonight. Through virtual events like tonight's, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to our community and our new digital community. Every week, we'll also be, ho we'll be hosting events here on our Zoom account and in our store. As always, our event schedule also appears on our website at harvard.com events, where you can sign up for our email newsletter and browse our bookshelves from home. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question for our speakers at any time during the talk tonight, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. This event will also have closed captioning available. Depending on the version of Zoom you're using, you may need to enable captions yourself by clicking on the closed caption button on your screen. In the chat, I'll be posting a link to purchase Fevered Star on harvard.com. Your purchases like make events like tonight's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore. So thank you for showing up and tuning in in support of our authors and the incredible staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstore. We sincerely appreciate your support now and always. And finally, as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings over these past years, technical issues may arise. If they do, we'll do our best to resolve them quickly and we thank you in advance for your patience and understanding. And so now I'm so pleased to introduce tonight's speakers. Rebecca Roanhorse is an award-winning New York Times bestselling author. She won the 2018 Astound Campbell Award for Best New Writer, and her work has won a Nebula, a Lee Hugo, and a Locus Award. She's written numerous short stories, as well as written for Marvel Comics and TV, and her novels include two books in the Sixth World series and Race to the Sun, as well as, of course, Black Sun, the first book in her Between Earth and Sky epic fantasy series. Tonight, Rebecca will be joined by award-winning author of the Five, Five Queendom series, G.R. McAllister, who also writes best-selling historical fiction under the name Greer McAllister and contributes to Writer on Box and the Chicago Review of Books. Her, the first installment of her Five Queendoms epic fantasy series, Scorpica, debuted earlier this year. Tonight, they'll be discussing Rebecca's latest installment in, between, in the Between Earth and Sky series, Fevered Star, which Kirk has called in a starred review, an excellent installment, second installment, that adds even more detail and intrigue with all the excellent plot machinations and stellar prose that readers know to expect from Roan Horse. We're so happy to have them both here tonight. So without further ado, the digital podium is yours, Greer and Rebecca. All right, I think we're good to go. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining. Um, I'm so excited to be here talking with you, Rebecca, talk, talking with you from very far away, um, but still together, which is great. One of the, one of the silver linings of uh, pandemic era. Um, and I promised on Twitter that I wouldn't just ask Shala questions because I have, <laughs> and most of my Shala questions are, you know, less of a question, more of a comment type things, which we know from conferences and uh, conversations are, are not what we're here for. Uh, we're here to uh, explore your world and get into your mind and understand where all of this fabulous, wonderful imagination um, and the, the canvas that is truly epic fantasy. Uh, comes from. So just as a starting point, um, obviously this is the second book in a series, but I would love to hear, and I'm sure uh, your readers would love to hear as well, sort of the, the kernel of inspiration. Because uh, I think most people know your um, more of your urban fantasy work, but this, it sounds like this may have been in the works or at least in your mind percolating for, for years and years. So can you tell us sort of when you decided you wanted to write epic fantasy um, in sort of this pre-Columbian civilization inspired world? Yeah, so um, my daughter just came in from school and she just got my dog out, the, out of my office door. So I was like side-eyeing them. But anyway, uh, yes, I think I have been writing, wanting to write this book as long as I can remember. Uh, I grew up reading uh, epic fantasy. Uh, gosh, I think um, uh, Susan uh, Cooper, The Dark is Rising, uh, were some of my uh, first uh, fantasy books when I was a kid. I went on to the Dragonlance Chronicles, um, the Belgaria, the Melorian, all of those, you know, and later, of course, like A Song of Ice and Fire and uh, the Robert Jordan series. Uh, so really, my imagination has been steeped in epic fantasy since I was a kid. But I think the one thing I always missed was, of course, all these stories take place in, you know, sort of sort of pseudo European inspired worlds. Uh, and I always wondered why there wasn't an epic fantasy set in the pre-Columbian Americas, or at least inspired by the pre-Columbian Americas, uh, because there were so many rich civilizations, you know, so much diversity 
uh, great cities, you know, to, to um, rival anything that Europe had uh, at the same time. Um, you know, um, astronomers and, and architecture and, and all of this stuff, you know, that just seemed ripe uh, for epic fantasy. Uh, and, and I never saw it. And, and there might be some out there that I've missed. I don't know every book, but certainly I searched and I couldn't find uh, what I really wanted to read as a reader. Uh, so I decided to write it. Uh, and that's, you know, sort of Toni Morrison's, you know, call to us all to sort of write, you know, the book uh, that you want to read. Uh, and, and so that's what I did. <laughs> um, and, you know, that's really where that came from. I think I've always wanted to write it. Uh, and um, I got lucky enough uh, to have the opportunity to do so. Uh, and so I definitely did. You know, and I have to say, clearly, this is not, uh, these are not historical books. You know, I know you mentioned, Grady, that you've written some uh, historical uh, fiction. Uh, and I definitely want to talk about that later. But this is this is fantasy. You know, there are giant flying crows. There is magic. Uh, I took a lot of liberties uh, with uh, the mixing of various cultures and, and times. Uh, uh, so it's definitely pre-Columbian inspired. Uh, and, and a lot of it also is just from my imagination. I just made it up. Uh, so I think that's part of the fun of being a fantasy writer, though, is being able to create worlds, uh, you know, the way that uh, you want to and not being completely tied to sort of historical accuracy. It is extremely freeing as a, you know, former and possibly future, the once in future historical novelist, you get them so many emails about like, oh, here's this minor thing that I think you got wrong, like the spelling of Derringer. I'm like, no, 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 it was somebody's name. Derringer was spelled with a capital D and, and a single R. Um, but you don't, you don't engage, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Never read the Goodreads reviews, or if you do have to read them, don't respond to them. Um, keep your distance, but it, but it is so wonderful to be able to be a magpie and to say, I like this from here. And I like this mm -hmm. from here. Um, and sometimes you're inventing because you have to, and sometimes you're inventing because you want to. Um, and so I'm curious for you, how much of it you were able to find, um, and I don't know if it's historical documents or it's, it's art or, um, the texts or, or what, what the evidence is that, that you can draw from, but how much of it were you able to say, okay, well, there were, or there weren't sky made clans, Carrion Crow is or is not invented. Um, how much of it was, was sort of drawn. And that's a hard question to answer, right? I'm not looking mm. for a percentage, but just, um, <laughs> maybe just a couple of the kernels that you did find in history that would be would be interesting to hear um, versus where you were able to just sort of totally roam free. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I sort of had this grounding in the pre-Columbian Americas. I've been um, sort of interested in that history and those various cultures uh, for decades, for, for, for a very, very long time, well, well before I became a writer. Uh, I was reading just for my pleasure and for sort of my edification. Uh, and so I drew from a lot of that. There are certain texts, which uh, actually in the back of Black Sun, I give a very small reading list of about six or seven books uh, that I think are sort of crucial to understanding uh, the pre-Columbian Americas, or at least helped me. Uh, books on the Maya, uh, some on the ancestral Puebloans of uh, Chaco Canyon. Uh, and of course, you know, places like Mesa Verde uh, and uh, Machu Picchu, uh, at Cahokia, all of these uh, influenced uh, my world, uh, as well as the languages, Yucatec Maya, Tewa, uh, things like that. Uh, I tried to use uh, to ground uh, sort of the um, vocabulary of these worlds. Uh, and I really wanted each culture to feel very different from uh, their neighbors, uh, which I think is true. Uh, to what we understand, um, well, I mean, even of like America now, there are 500, you know, different like tribal nations. So uh, it's not a monolith. And I didn't want to create an America's um, of a pretend history <laughs> that was a monolith either. Uh, so I really tried uh, to bring all of those together. Uh, and, you know, one place, for example, that I did some research uh, that I didn't know a lot about was the Maritime Maya. Uh, and there is not a lot to find out about the Maritime Maya, at least uh, for the lay person. Uh, I did look at a lot of academic journals uh, and what we do know is fairly uh, limited, but I wanted, um, I knew I was gonna create Shiala. Uh, she's my sea captain. And so I wanted to create a culture around her that felt true to the Maritime Maya. 
um, or really around Coca-Cola. Uh, and so, um, you know, I, I wanted to see how they built uh, their ships, you know, and were they canoes and like, how big were they? And there are accounts of um, the Spanish, you know, seeing a, a canoe and being like, holy crap, that's a big ship, you know, things like that. And, you know, trying to find out whether they'd use paddles or did they use oars, you know, did they use sails? What, what did their trade routes look like? Uh, because, you know, I think that's something that we overlook in our own history uh, of the Americas, or at least it's not taught in school, that these cultures traded extensively across continents. You know, we find, you know, uh, abalone shells that are only in the Pacific, off the Pacific coast in like, you know, Missouri or in Florida and, you know, things in Michigan that only came from Central America. And, and so I wanted to capture a lot of that. Uh, so I did, you know, read as much history as I could, uh, but certainly there's a time when that stops uh, and you start to imagine. So the sky make plans, um, really that's, you know, sort of made up, um, but if, for example, the emphasis on the number four is not like you'll notice there's a lot of fours. There's four clans, there's four city states. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of other fours in there uh, because four is sort of a, a sacred number in a lot of indigenous cultures. And I wanted, you know, to stay true to that. Uh, but then uh, you have like the fifth clan, you know, the coyote. Well, if you haven't read Favorite Star, I don't <laughs> want to give that away. I'm going to try not to spoil, but if I do, I apologize. Uh, but you have some outliers, I'll say that. Uh, and there's a reason for that too. Uh, but, you know, for example, uh, I did a lot of uh, research on crows actually, uh, because at the time I wrote Fever Star, uh, well, when I started it, and no, I mean, I'm Black Sun really, I guess, because that came first. Uh, we were living in this house uh, with a big outdoor um, uh, balcony up in the, we're kind of up in the mountains a little bit in, in Santa Fe. Uh, and I had a flock of crows come and visit me all the time. And there was an abandoned house next door and they loved to roost in that house. And then they'd fly over and they'd, you know, just chat, chat, chat at me and, you know, come and check things out. And, uh, and so I just really got interested in crows. Uh, and so I read uh, a great book, which I actually have here. I do keep this one called The Gift of the Crow. And you can see it, how perception, emotion, and thought allow smart birds to behave like humans. And so I got really interested in this and learning about crows and, and how they never forget a face. You know, they've done these experiments where if you do them wrong, you know, they remember. Uh, and then they tell their children and their children's children. Uh, and they hold a grudge <laughs> and they spread it around like, don't trust that guy. Uh, you know, and so that sort of planted the kernel of this idea of a clan. Like what if you had a clan or people who were, who were modeled after a crow? And so they were people uh, of long memory, you know, like a people of vengeance. Uh, and, and that was sort of one of their defining uh, cultural traits that they held this, you know, sort of um, um, grudge. <laughs> uh, and so out of that came the idea of Carrion Crow Clan. Uh, and of course, you know, Serapio and this idea that they had been done a generational wrong. Because uh, of course, you know, there's touches of um, um, ancestral memory and, and survivorship and things like that throughout the story. Uh, and so I imagine that, you know, if they had done this ancestral wrong and they were waiting for their God to sort of return and make things right, like what would that sort of look like? Uh, and how would that fit into um, a mythology, a crow mythology. Uh, so yeah, that's, I kind of went on a long time, but like- No, that's, that's perfect. Sort of that's that. <laughs> what I wanted to hear. And I love, like you said, the, the crows of long memory. So both the crow people and the literal crows in their interactions with Serapio, you're seeing mm. exactly what you're talking about. And then moving as a, as a group and a, a plan and working together. Um, I'm trying not to spoil either, but at the end of Black Sun, like the crows are so important and then they carry us into um, literally and figuratively again mm. into, into the second book. So the second book really, for those who haven't read it yet, really picks up right where um, the first left off. And I just, um, I listened to the audiobook, which is wonderful. It oh, has nice. the different narrators. Um, I feel like the danger is, the, the danger with a fantasy book is if you listen to the audio book you don't know how anything is spelled and if you read the book you don't know how anything is pronounced um, right. the, the voices are just so wonderful um 
in uh, in the audiobook, and I got chills every time. So so first of all, like your little chapter heading things, I want to talk about um, little epigraphs from books that that probably don't exist. Uh, mm-hmm. And then when they say you're one of the crow, every time I'm like, oh yeah, that's right, <laughs> this a whole new thing. Like it wasn't that before, but it's now. It's it's you're one of the crow now. Um, but yeah, at what point in the writing process did you decide to to be quoting from the Obregi Book of Flowers and and all of these different the the manual by a spear maiden and and all of those things? Yeah, so the epigraphs that start each chapter uh, in my first well, I wrote one first draft that I won't go into that was sort of a disaster, and my editor we have actually the same editor oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> was like eh, so. <laughs> I went back it was like a 95,000 uh word draft too and I just tore I you know it was so bad that he hated we didn't hate it but he wasn't that impressed so I went home and I just tore it all apart uh and started again and so rebuilt the story from scratch Uh, and he was right of course that's why we have editors to tell us uh when we are not at our best uh and to help us get better uh and so I had written that second draft and I had interstitials uh which were like you know these little sayings like I probably had like four or five and he it was actually his suggestion he was like uh what if you create epigraphs and you put these little interstitials at the beginning of each uh chapter do you think you can do that do you have enough and I was like oh yeah (laughs) I I absolutely do uh and so that actually ended up uh being one of the most fun aspects of writing the novels um uh yeah so so each one has a little quote of some kind I guess it's sort of thematic to the chapter uh from books or from sayings uh, like the teak sayings for example the wisdom you know sort of of, of teak culture uh, that are completely made up, obviously. Uh, there's no book of lamentations. There's no book of flowers. Uh, but I almost feel like I could write one at this point because uh, I've done so many. And I think what those really helped do is ground the world building. So not only they were they fun to write, but I think they're really functional. Uh, for example, in Black Sun, you don't find out a lot about the teak. Uh, all you know is sort of like what Shiala tells you. And you know she doesn't tell you very much because uh, she has her reasons. Um, And so the taste of teak culture that you get is only through these epigraphs. But I think they do a really good job, hopefully, of giving you a flavor of, you know, what teak is like and and what you can sort of expect. Uh, And a a mild spoiler that I think as you read Fevered, you get a little more teak in Fevered Star. And then I think it should be pretty apparent that, you know, book three, you're going to get a whole lot of teak. Uh, and so, you know, that's kind of exciting. I love setting that up. I love what those epigraphs can kind of do to expand on specific philosophies and cultures. And of course, there is uh, in Black Sun, uh, Seiya, uh, who is Serapio's mother. Uh, you don't really get a lot of her, of course. It's not spoilery. I don't think to say she dies in chapter one of Black Sun. Real early, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> real early. But you have her sayings throughout uh, the book. Uh, So she is still present. You know, I could still keep her present in a lot of ways, even though uh, I did not have room or, you know, the story doesn't, isn't about her, you know, so it really needs to, she needed to sort of move off screen at the beginning uh, and let this be, you know, her son's story. But anyway, yeah, that's, that's kind of the the background on those. Um, Well, you know, I want to talk about Teak, um, because matriarchy and yes. um, all of the the matrons that you have, and sort of my first question is whether that was something that you wanted to bring to the story, or whether that was something that evolved out of your research. Um, a little bit of both. Uh, I feel like in, a lot of indigenous cultures uh, are, um, at the very least, matrilineal. Um, there are. Uh, probably a handful maybe that are that are matriarchies but I certainly made more than history tells us uh and I wanted them to be different kinds of matriarchies uh some are more democratic than others uh and of course uh some of the cultures are not matriarchies at all uh like Wakola um and I, I sort of wanted to play with this idea of women as rulers women in powerful positions uh, not just women, but non-binary people too. Like how did that fit into this concept of matriarchy? Uh, and did it matter? 
Um, yeah, so so I took a lot of liberties. So those are really fantasy liberties. But I know you uh, and Scorpica, for folks who haven't read it, it's awesome and you <laughs> should go read it because it is an epic fantasy steeped in matriarchy. Uh, so just, I don't know, just to shift a little bit, what made you decide to write uh, such a matriarchy heavy epic fantasy? Well, it's funny because it's so similar to what you were talking about. Mm. Like, why isn't there a book um, set in this pre-Columbian um, series of societies? And just like you said, like, we don't know every single book out there. There are lots of books set in matriarchies, um, not lots, like there are dozens. <laughs> there are three. Set no. yeah. in <laughs> um, and I, I wrote a bit about this for Lit Hub. And I'm like, yes, there's this one and there's that one. But so many of them are utopia or dystopia. It's either the women are in charge and everything's great, which is not realistic, um, or it's the women are in charge and everything's worse than ever, which is usually people trying to make a point about how um, everything's fine now because patriarchy is fine because matriarchy could possibly be just as bad. So we shouldn't even like explore egalitarian societies, let alone um, matriarchy. But anyway, um, but I really wanted something that just is so female default and female centric in the way that something like Lord of the Rings is just male, 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 with some ladies in it. Um, and so it, I have probably gone a little farther than I needed to making it, you know, all the main characters are women, all of the point of view characters are women, there are men in it, and they play important roles. Um, but again, sort of in, in discussions with the editor, uh, at one point, we were sort of looking at it and saying, well, do we want to put in a point of view character? Um, who's a man just for people who are, who are going to want that. And I thought about it and I said, well, the people who are going to, for the people for whom it makes a difference that there's one male POV character are going to hate the book anyway. <laughs> like, they're not going to come just for like, if Hermione has a chapter in his point of view, they're still not going to like the book and that's fine. Um, not every book is for every person. Uh, but yeah, I wanted something that was just totally female dominated and a little bit like you talked about the more women you have the more different models of female power you can have the more complexity of of motherhood like one of my uh author friends wrote a, a beautiful post on instagram for mother's day about in scorpica there are all these different ways to be a mother and there are wonderful nurturing mothers and there are horrible destructive mothers and there are mothers who who raise their kids in a group situation because they shouldn't have to do everything themselves. And it's, it's um, an interesting thing to explore. So I wanted to impose that on the very traditional epic, epic fantasy, passing around the, the viewpoint from character to character, rising and falling and unexpected deaths and um, all of that, that kind of fun stuff. So I was very lucky to, um, to find a home um, for what is now contracted for three books, but kind of hoping that I get to do five because it's five queendoms. I feel like there should be five books, um, but we'll see. We'll see where we go from here. Um, but for you, so are you doing trilogy and done or are you looking at, at a broader canvas or what is your plan at this point, knowing that plans can always change? Yeah, so, you know, I had originally sort of wanted to do four books for four, you know, reasons, four. <laughs> my, my fours, <laughs> uh, but we decided on three, so it is a trilogy, so there will only be one more book, uh, but don't be surprised if it's very chonky, uh, because I had to fit two books in there, uh, but yeah, we decided on a trilogy, you know, one of the questions uh, that my editor, our editor, asked me uh, was, um, how long do you want to live in this world? Uh, uh, because while it might take, you know, a day or a week or a month, hopefully a couple of days to read the book, it takes us like a year and a half to write the book, get it through edits, get it, you know, to the folks who make books, you know, and all of that stuff. So it's, it's a long process to create the book. Uh, and so the author is, is, you know, sort of tied to that world uh, for that amount of time. And are there other stories you want to tell? Uh, and, and there are some other stories uh, that I'm excited to tell. Uh, and so those will come. And will I return to this world? I, I might, uh, you know, I mentioned uh, Srapio's mother, Seiya, uh, and I would love to sort of tell her story uh, and that friend group, that strange little friend group she had uh, uh, coming out of the Night of Knives with uh, Balam and Quage and, the, and uh, Srapio's other tutors. And so maybe, 
you know, maybe there's a story in there, uh, but certainly this story that I'm telling now will come to a conclusion. I know some of you are very worried <laughs> about uh, cliffhangers and things like that, but it will come to a conclusion with book three, you know, and, and clearly these three books are meant to be read together. You know, this is, this is sort of a longer story uh, that I want, did not want to have to tell. And you know, one big 800 page book, I don't even know if that would have been enough, you know? And so I don't know that like 1200 page books really sell these days, unless you're uh, Brandon Sanderson or something, but um, you know, in the tradition of epic fantasy, I wanted to write this very sort of classic uh, feeling uh, trilogy, you know, well, four books, but trilogy, uh, the way that you mentioned Greer, you know, where you sort of this is a different take on a lot of the same tropes, you know, but I've changed the tropes, you know, something like um, the, the chosen one, you know, Serapio is very much within sort of the, the chosen one uh, realm of characters, but hopefully I've sort of uh, interrogated that trope a little bit, turned it on, on its head. And now you get to see uh, what the, what happens after the chosen one is it the chosen one anymore? You know, how, do, how does that person deal with that? Because most epic fantasy, you sort of end on this high triumphant note of, oh, you know, he has risen to power and now everything is good in the world. Well, what if it's sort of, excuse my language, what if it's sort of a shit show <laughs> and you've got to deal, you know, with the fallout, you know, not only the larger society and in, in dealing, you know, with giving power to, you know, someone like this or someone who's imbued uh, with magic or God power or whatever, or at least believes he is, like, where, where does that line? Uh, and then what happens to that person uh, who was a vessel for this power uh, and now has to try to be a human? Is that even possible? Uh, and so anyway, those are the sorts of questions that sort of uh, get me excited and, and the sort of uh, things that I wanted to explore in the books. And so, yeah, I can't remember what your original question was. <laughs> me neither, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's big questions, big page count. Like you need, yeah. in order to explore all of these dynamics of power um, and all of these people interweaving, one of my favorite things about epic fantasy that, that I'm getting to do with my series and that, that you're doing so beautifully in this series is there's a character that was in one storyline in Black Sun who pops up in another storyline in uh, Fevered Star. And I was like, I think I know who that is. Because um, there's obviously time between, um, you know, reading one and reading the other, unless, you know, I should have I should have reviewed Black Sun before jumping to Fevered Star, but I had no patience. I had to jump just directly into Fevered Star. Fair enough. Uh, but it's it's fun I think for the reader and I found it fun as an author to to sort of weave those threads differently as opposed yeah. to just keeping them the separate Absolutely. All the way. So Absolutely. when that person um did what that person does so well um I was very uh, happy <laughs> awesome so um we're going to talk a little bit longer, but I just want to flag for attendees. If you do have questions, um, type them into the Q and A. I'm going to point down here. It's somewhere along here, um, not the chat, but the Q and A specifically. If you type questions in, then we will field them in sort of the second half of the hour here, and you can ask whatever you want to know. Um, we can talk about craft. We can talk about um, one of the things that I wanted to to be sure to talk about is. Um, you mentioned like what other stories might you want to tell and, and mm. i've written historical fiction which is very grounded um in reality it's not biographical historical fiction for most of mine but um but sort of still bound by 20th century american history as a as a setting um and shifting from that to epic fantasy was something but you're shifting not only within kinds of fantasy but to short stories and TV and uh, all these other genres. So do you want to talk a little bit about, um, is it hard to relearn writing for each of these genres or do you feel like your skills um, translate or are they even strengthened by doing, um, you know, these different screenwriting versus uh, book versus other things? Right, yeah, so I've written, uh, yeah, so novels, now a novella, very challenging, actually. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, short stories, comic books, um, and uh, now I've been in a couple of TV writers rooms. Uh, and I'm also adapting uh, Black Sun uh, for AMC. I'm writing the pilot. Uh, so that's actually really exciting. Uh, that's a lot of fun. 
Uh, and each one, you know, is sort of different. Uh, I feel like I learned a lot from being in the writer's rooms. Writer's rooms are very, that's, that's oh, so for TV shows, uh, they are always you know, sort of a collaboration or most often a collaboration. Uh, and so you have anywhere from, I don't know, five to 12 people or something uh, getting together and creating the story together. And then you often have someone like a showrunner, you know, who, who runs the show and is in charge. Uh, but I was in writer's rooms during uh, COVID. Um, and so uh, we met on Zoom. Uh, and that was really a great opportunity because no, I'm not in LA. <laughs> I don't have any plans to move to LA. Uh, knock on wood, you never know. But uh, I was able to participate in these writers' rooms uh, without being there in person. Uh, and so that was a lot of fun. Uh, I learned a lot about you know, the exchange of ideas and, and how to build uh, sort of episodic uh, storytelling, which I think is very helpful. Uh, and also how to build character uh, even more so. I mean, character is sort of my thing. Hopefully I'm doing it well. Um, and so, and I think that's sort of why I was brought into the writer's rooms to begin with, uh, but that just really emphasized uh, the importance of character and, and how character carries story uh, and how important that is. Uh, and so um, I think it's, I, it is a learning curve uh, to write, to start screenwriting. Uh, I find it <laughs> in my early uh, scripts, they're like, why are you describing everything? That's not your job. <laughs> <laughs> and there, there's whole, you know, teams of people who are going to do that part. You know, you, you stick to, you know, the, the uh, action and the dialogue. That's, that's all you get. Uh, but now, you know, of course, uh, when you write screenwriter for epic fantasy, they're like, tell us about your world. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a little challenging um, both ways. Uh, and then, you know, for short stories, gosh. It really depends, you know, I think for short stories, I often have an idea that is not big enough for a whole novel, or I don't imagine, you know, this, this is, this is just an idea that I want to explore, or this is even often, you know, some emotion that I want to sort of dig into or something. Uh, and so it's, I go into a short story very aware that I have limited uh, word count. And I need to get you know my point across pretty succinctly, and hopefully end with some sort of emotional punch, uh, and you know, and that's sort of that. Uh, and then, gosh, okay, I would say that comic books are very similar to screenwriting; they're much more like that because then you have wonderful artists uh, who bring your story to life on the page, and that is just amazing. Like that's. I think often that's like the writer's dream, right? Because for me, I'm a very visual writer, but I can't make art. Like I can barely draw stick figures. It's just terrible. So for me to, I have all these, you know, ideas in my head and I see them. Like when I write, I actually visualize the scenes playing out. Uh, and so uh, I, you know, I know what everyone looks like in my mind and how things work and all this stuff, but just because it's in here doesn't mean it makes it to the page. You know, that's the hard part is translating your thoughts to, to words and then having someone come in and translate your thoughts to like visuals is just amazing. I mean, I love it. I love writing for comics. It's really cool. It's really interesting. It sounds like it's really a a, a scale or a spectrum of collaboration, right? Where the, the TV writer's room is the most collaborative sort of thing. Yes. Where you're, you're all there and, and talking to each other. Maybe short stories are the least collaborative, but I feel like novels, people have that sort of writer in a garret, like isolated kind of vision of novelists. But I find, especially with a good editor, and even like my copy editor saved my hide like so many times. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Like, did you realize that like <laughs> you have this person who's like three years have passed and you've made them five years older than they're supposed to, you know? And and so just catching all of that so that the people with the emails aren't, aren't catching it for me after it's already been printed. <laughs> um, and the beautiful covers, like your covers are so um, gorgeous. So we can give a shout out to, um, to Saga. And is it is it John Picasso who does um, mm -hmm. both yes. of your house covers? Ah. Beautiful, yeah, John Picasso, amazing. Have you seen your third one yet? Uh, no. <laughs> it will be that gorgeous. Good, yeah, certain it will be gorgeous. Um, and at what point in the process do you do titles? I always find that interesting. Or do you do you do your titles? <laughs> yeah, I do. Um, 
this one I knew uh, gosh I think I knew from the beginning I I, I fiddled a little with favorite star I love uh oh let's see what it I'm trying to remember. Oh, I remember. Uh, so it feels like a long time ago that I wrote Black Sun. Uh, so originally, I actually wanted to call the book Between Earth and Sky. Uh, and the feedback was, that's kind of wieldy. It's unwieldy. You know, it's kind of big. Uh, maybe we could be a little more succinct. And so I came up with Black Sun. So, you know, they often are like, yeah, we didn't know about this title. Give us like five others you like and we'll see what works. Uh, and then Fevered Star, uh, they loved off the bat. That's very cool. Because I love this concept of uh, a fevered land, actually. And I was like, no, but we want to stay, you know, we want to stay in the sky and all that stuff. So, and I knew uh, book three's title pretty much from the beginning. I knew how that wanted to, how I wanted that to go. Uh, so I won't give that away. It hasn't been announced yet, uh, but I do have it. Uh, and then we decided to call the series Between Earth and Sky, which is very uh, sort of um, uh, very in keeping, I think, with sort of uh, the pre-Columbian uh, philosophy as well. This idea of like, you know, what happens, you know, above in the heavens is, is um, mirrored on Earth sort of stuff and the gods and the humans and, and all this sort of thing. So that worked uh, well for me. I know you had a title change, too, didn't you? I did. Yeah. I was, I was in one of those situations where they're like, yeah, nothing's quite right. Like, why don't you give us some more? So I gave them some more and they're like, I don't know. What about, you know, um, so it was, it was quite a process. Um, but yeah, I, when I wrote the first book, I just always called it the five queendoms. Um, because to me, that's sort of the, it's partly a sales pitch. It's like, this is going to be a book about queendoms. Mm -hmm. You don't get, have enough books about queendoms, <laughs> this one. Um, but they felt it was too passive, I think. So it's mm -hmm. the same sort of thing. We went with the five queendoms for um, for the, the series. And so we made sure that it's on the cover. It does say the five queendoms book one um, at the top, which is important, um, along with a beautiful blurb from <laughs> Rebecca. Thank Yay! you so much. Because I loved it. It's really, really good. You guys should read it for sure. Um, and uh, yeah, so late in the game, and I think it was, I think it was Joe who said, um, let's try one word, like, let's try just a word. Um, and most of the words have been taken. It turns out, you know, you're like, right. oh, I can't, can't do that one, can't do that one, can't do that one. So we were, there was a moment where we were going to call it barren, because in mm -hmm. the Scorpican society, a woman who only has boys is barren because she's not having girls. She's not having heirs to, to pass things along to because it's matrilineal. Um, and we almost went with that. And then we said, well, that's just not, people aren't going to see it on the shelf or see it in thumbnail and say, yeah, I want to read a book with that name. So um, so then it was really late in the game. And I'm just, why don't we just call it Scorpica? Um, and so uh, so we've picked- because Scorpica is one of the queendoms, correct? Yes, exactly. It's one of the one of the queendoms. And so you roam through the different queendoms. I mean, there, there's characters in, in almost all five of the queendoms. You're following three major storylines, um, but um, sort of free flowing across the queendoms, but the, the most, most of what happens is in Scorpica because the, the inciting event for those who, who um, haven't read sort of the blurb of it or the, the summary, um, it's a matriarchal society. Women are in charge and always have been. And then suddenly girls stop being born suddenly on one day and, and for years afterward, every child who's born is a boy, uh, which was basically the, my like, what's the worst thing that could possibly happen in a matriarchal world is cut off the, the pipeline of women. Um, so that's where it all sort of flowed from. Um, and so, yeah, so of the five queendoms, they all have different models and, and different priorities and different ways that, that different genders are, are integrated into the society. Um, but Scorpica the, is the warrior nation of all women. It's close, closest to sort of like the Amazons um, model. And so they're the ones that are going to suffer the most if, um, if no more girls are born. So that's where we, we landed for the, the start. Um, and then um, just gorgeous, uh, gorgeous art by um, Victo Nye did the, the cover on this one. And she's working on the second one and I'm really excited. Oh, so nice. I haven't, oh. haven't seen it yet, um, but it's it's on the way. So um, I wanted to jump off from something that you said about um, character kind of being your thing. And 
Uh, people always ask me this question and I never know how to answer it. So of course, <laughs> I'm throwing it over to someone else. Um, but they ask sort of what, whether plot or character comes first in your mm -hmm. writing. And for me, they're totally inseparable. Like it, it's the characters are making the plot and it, it's, it, you can't pull it apart. But do you have do you go into a draft knowing what you want to happen or do you go in with, okay, I want Shella and I want Serapio and I want, um, you know, it's uh, Iktan and these different people to interact in, in different ways and see what happens? Um, well, I think, so Black Sun started with character uh, in my rewrite. <laughs> so uh, out of that first draft that was not so great, <laughs> I kept uh, my, I kept Shiala, that wasn't her name at the time, mm -hmm. uh, but I knew I wanted this sort of um, promiscuous, hard drinking, uh, bisexual sailor. Uh, and um, then I had to sort of create a world around her. So, so I guess character leads my world building. And then as I build out my world, uh, the plot sort of starts to happen. So I did have Serapio, he, that name actually does uh, survive from that early draft, but he was nothing like what he is now. And I had Tova. Uh, and so I knew, you know, sort of like, okay, I want Shiala and Serapio to interact and I want them to get to Tova at some point. And so that was sort of how that story started. Uh, and so, you know, I guess they're sort of hand in hand. I think I'm a little more like you. I would say character is one step ahead. Uh, I think uh, I'm much more comfortable with a character driven story uh, than a plot driven story, uh, which I think is sort of interesting because I know I know some people think like, oh, you know, Rebecca Horn, she writes action. And I do write action, but I write like character driven action. <laughs> <laughs> so if the story is not all action, 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 uh, that's right, because that's not actually what I do. Uh, I want these um, sort of long character arcs uh, where, you know, people are having highs and lows and maybe they're a bit emo today and maybe they're killing people tomorrow. I don't know. Uh, but that's that's what I enjoy reading. That's what I enjoy writing. Uh, I really spend a lot of time in my characters' heads, you know, in their worlds. Uh, and that's what comes out on the page. Uh, and that's, yeah, that, that's what I enjoy. Uh, we've got a few questions. Uh, I think we can pull up a few um, with our last 15 minutes or so. Um, I find this one interesting. So let's, let's uh, have Rebecca answer this one. What is your dream genre to write in? That is, if you had to write outside your typical areas, obviously you have a lot of typical areas, uh, what would you like to try your hand at? Is there anything that you haven't written yet that you'd love to get your hands on? Uh, well, so I... Sheesh. So I recently wrote a, a novella. It'll be out in November. It's called Tread of Angels. And it's a bit of a murder mystery. Uh, it's, yeah, I think that's fair. Uh, it's kind of like a Western noir. Uh, it's uh, got angels and demons. Uh, it's set in sort of an ambiguous alternative uh, 1800s uh, in a mining town. Uh, only the people uh, who mine their, uh, are not mining gold or silver, they're mining uh, the corpse of a fallen angel uh, for their technology. And so, but, but it's a murder mystery. Uh, and so that would be a genre that I would love to spend a little more time figuring out. I think, oh, you know what I would love? I'd love to write a heist. Mm. I think they're so difficult to write though. A good heist that like hits all the right buttons uh, might take more brain power than I have. <laughs> I don't know. I would really have to figure that out. But like a, a satisfying heist is like one of my favorite uh, kinds of books or or even uh, movies. Um, so and I, I love that whole team thing where you have your ragtag group of, you know, like people who all have a specialty and then, you know, they make shit happen. So that's cool. Um, yeah, you know, maybe one day, uh, not right now. I mean, I think whatever I'm writing in at that moment, is what I want to explore. Uh, and I'm very lucky that I have an editor and a publisher who support me and allow me to sort of jump around and write epic fantasy and then write this sort of weird Western noir murder mystery. And then um, I have a very, very future novel uh, that is gonna be um, sort of uh, set in a, a near future West with uh, 
gangsters and weather magic and all sorts of uh, strange stuff. So uh, I'm excited to write that one too. Uh, and we'll see, I guess that's more like a mafia, a mafia book, but you know, with climate change and magic. Uh, so yeah. So the murder mystery Western is this fall, right? Yes. In Tread November. of Angels. Tread of Angels. Awesome. Looking forward to that. Mm -hmm. um, next question, as far as your writing goes, is there anyone in your life or any moment that you can remember that sort of gave you permission to feel like you could write and use your voice to craft stories like this? Oh, gosh. Well, so in third grade, <laughs> I won a poetry contest and, uh, and that was sort of it. I was like, that, this is my calling. I know it. <laughs> and then in seventh grade, uh, I turned a uh, science report on the planets into this very sort of emo uh, astronaut uh, on a mission who has to like suicide into the sun. Clearly I was influenced by like, you know, Major Tom and, you know, all that sort of stuff. Uh, and then in eighth grade, I wrote, I think my first epic fantasy. I actually wrote my first urban fantasy too. And then I wrote a story about like smugglers because there was too much Star Wars going on in my head. <laughs> And uh, so, gosh, you know, I've been writing stuff like that forever uh, in my little notebook, you know, with my big loopy handwriting before the age of computers. I'm not even going to say how old I am, uh, but I did have floppy disks by the time I hit like eighth grade or something. Uh, so I don't know that there was ever a specific moment, but I definitely had teachers like my eighth grade teacher because we wrote a, a class project that was sort of this urban fantasy sci-fi thing. And we each wrote a chapter, every student wrote a chapter. Uh, and I got to write like uh, the final chapter, uh, if I recall correctly. Uh, and, you know, it was awesome. And it was really corny. I mean, I don't even want to say like, there was like a uh, interstellar police force, but we called it the Isalop because you spell police backwards, you know, but oh, yeah. uh, so it was limited. It was limited, uh, but it was so much fun. And, and that was sort of my, um, uh, I guess probably that was the first time I was like, you know what, this is okay. Uh, I can do this. Uh, and I did not do it professionally for years and years. Uh, I, I put writing away uh, when I went to college um, to do more serious business. Uh, and I became an attorney. Well, I was a computer programmer for 10 years and I was an attorney for 10 years. And only when that started to uh, drive me nuts uh, because I did not enjoy the law, uh, the practice of law, uh, that I started to return to writing. And I returned to writing purely as a pleasure, purely as something that I wanted to do for myself. Uh, I never even thought about publishing. Uh, but in fact, the, the story that I wrote turned out to be my first novel. Uh, and so, you know, I went, I went from there. So very luckily in midlife, I found, you know, the calling I probably should have like stuck to since third grade. Sometimes you have to go through the whole thing to get to, to where you want to be. Right? Absolutely. And all that experience, all that life experience comes into my books, you know, and hopefully it pays off. So yeah, there's yeah. something, something to draw on. I, I feel like I know a lot more former attorneys than I know hmm. current attorneys. And most of my <laughs> friends who are yeah. former attorneys are writers. So I think there's something about the brain the way the brain works that says, okay, well, let's shift our, because there's a lot of writing involved in the law, right? But yeah, and different. a lot of storytelling actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's sort of the plausible explanation for, for things. Yes. A lot of former journalists and a lot of former um, attorneys in the, in the writing world. Yeah. Uh, among the, the group that I know. Um, this is a question that's more sort of specific to, um, between Earth, Earth and Sky series, um, obviously you've got a whole series that you're working through, um, but are there things you had to leave out of this book? Um, and maybe it's book two, or maybe it's even book one, depending on, on what's what you're thinking. Um, are there things you had to leave out of this book or these books that you wish you could have kept? Hmm. I don't, not, not that I can think of. That doesn't mean that there wasn't and now I've forgotten. Uh, cause I sort of have a terrible memory, <laughs> but, um, no, there are things that I decided just didn't fit. Uh, for example, like say a story, uh, and gosh, you know, they, for me, when, when you do these sort of massive multi-point of view, uh, books, um, 
it's very, you don't, you don't get to spend as much time with each character in each book, you know, as you possibly could. Uh, and that's always a little bit frustrating. Like if the books could go on for 500 pages, and I know there are fantasies that do, but that wasn't part of the agenda um, for me. Uh, you know, that would be very tempting. You know, that would be a lot of fun uh, to just spend way more time in, you know, with Serapio or something uh, in Fevered Star. Uh, but there are reasons uh, behind my choices. And, you know, and I think in the end, the things that I want to be there are there. Yeah. And then the nice thing that the, when you're writing a series, you can sort of lift something out and, and move it over. Um, yeah, that's true. But yeah. Um, but yeah, if you're, I'm a very messy writer and I just sort of slop everything out there and then I have to go back and fix it. So it's a short writing period, but a very long rewriting period. Um, so there are sort of things that, that, um, fall by the wayside there, or my agent or my editor says, Hey, this thing doesn't need to be here. How about it's not there? And then I did sort of like you were talking about with <laughs> the process by which you arrived at Black Sun. It's like, no, no, I'm keeping it. And then like less than 24 hours later, like, dang it, <laughs> like, oh, right. yeah. I'm going to have to like cut this character or change the spot line or or whatever, but that is, you know, we're all just trying to make it the best book it can be. And whatever painful process we go through is, is the process that we go through to get there. Very true. All right, I think we've got one last question from the audience. Oh no, there's more people typing. Thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna jump down to this one because I really like it. Do you have any thoughts about why academia has been resistant to fantasy? Hmm. No, you know, I did not uh, get a formal education in writing. <laughs> uh, uh, I was telling um, our host earlier, you know, that I went to Yale uh, and here I am at Harvard Bookstore and I almost wore my little like sweatshirt, but uh, I did not. Uh, my husband wanted me to represent, but I, I abstained because I'm a little old for college sweatshirts. But um, no, I studied religious studies. <laughs> uh, as an undergrad. And then uh, I have a master's degree in theology and, and a law degree. Uh, so never did I get a formal education in writing. I don't have an MFA or anything like that. Um, so, and I know it's quite, you know, the thing that uh, a lot of MFA programs uh, sort of uh, are not fans of fantasy, science fiction and fantasy, uh, because it's not taken as seriously. But, you know, let's be honest, if you look at the New York Times bestseller list, you know, and you see Emily St. John Mandel, and you see Colson Whitehead, uh, and you see all kinds of authors, what are they writing? They're writing science fiction and fantasy, uh, and they're just calling it literary fiction. And certainly, you know, there are different tropes, and there's different ways you put a literary, you know, book together, I suppose. Uh, but the, 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 those books that are considered a little more serious that I'm sure academia has no problems with are clearly science fiction and fantasy. Um, and uh, so I don't know, all these sort of labels and, and uh, a bit of snobbery uh, around genre is to me, it's just a load of crap. I'll be quite honest, <laughs> but you know, whatever, to each their own. Uh, as Greer wisely said, not every book is for everybody. So yeah. But it is super annoying. Um, exactly. And, and exactly like you said, like if you call it, if you call it speculative, highbrow, you know, literary speculative fiction, it's sci-fi. There's moon colonies, there's time travel. Like I'm thinking of a book in particular, but um, mm -hmm. people, people say, oh, there's literary and there's genre. But the truth is that literary is a genre. And I do have an MFA and it's super annoying um, <laughs> to have gone through it. And I also, my schooling is mumbledy mumble years old now. Um, and I hope it's different in MFA programs now, but I don't, from what I'm hearing, it's totally not, um, at least in, in certain MFA programs. So, um, you know, they're, they're teaching the short story. They're teaching um, very character forward, plot less important. Um, they weren't, at least when, when I was in MFA, teaching how to try to get published, which is mm. a really important thing that is completely separate from craft and has nothing whatsoever to do with craft, but you got to learn it if you want, if that is your goal um, to, to get, um, 
to get traditionally published. And so there's, I have friends who have MFAs and friends who don't, and it has absolutely no bearing on their success and the quality of their writing. Uh, in my opinion, I loved my MFA just because it gave me two years to just focus on writing and just focus on craft. But then I had to get a real job and, and do that. I happened to get a, a, a job in marketing writing, which is great and actually does help um, this kind of writing as well. But, um, but the dismissal of genre, I think it's, it's completely groundless. And I think I don't know where it comes from other than just the basic human need to exclude and say, well, we're better than them because of this. Uh, but they're not. They're, they're definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We are getting close to the end of time. Um, we have one more audience question that we can ask. It's for both of us. Uh, and the question is, it's related sort of to the earlier thing about, about cutting um, things for when you're writing, do you keep a file of things that you have to cut? Do you keep scenes or characters or something else to recycle into future books? So it sounds like for your Black Sun process, you had a draft and you did pull the things that you wanted, but what happened to the things that didn't get pulled? Yeah, so I definitely have like that scrap file. Like I'm constant. So I edit as I go. Uh, so often, even if even if my editor says my first draft is not so good, it's not because it's not well written. It's just because, you know, that's not the story that it needs to be. Uh, so my first draft is often quite clean. I'm not a fast uh, early drafter, uh, although I do do quite a lot of um, rewriting, uh, it seems, <laughs> but <laughs> recently at least. Uh, but so I'll, I'll write a chapter. The next day I'll edit it. I'll add another chapter. Then I'll edit those two. You know, I sort of, it sort of grows. So I'm constantly cutting things out. Uh, or something that doesn't work, or this dialogue doesn't work, or maybe I need to, you know, do this later. And then I put it all in a little scrap uh, folder uh, in Scrivener. Uh, and often I'll come back and, you know, maybe snag something from there to put in a later chapter. Uh, or maybe there's a snippet of dialogue that needs to go, you know, somewhere else. So that sort of thing, I often recycle earlier ideas into later stories. Um, but I haven't had like a character that I created for story A, you know, happen in story B or something like that. Uh, but yeah, I definitely, I definitely keep stuff. Yeah. I, I've been trying to write in Scrivener, but I, I keep my research in Scrivener, but I write in Word. I am a mm. creature of habit. <laughs> and I haven't gotten away from it yet. I think our host is coming back on to wrap us up. No. Oh, okay. Great. Yes, thank you both so much. This is really wonderful, very fascinating. Um, so thank you to Rebecca and Greer. Thank you all about all of you out there for spending your evening with us. Uh, you can learn more about Fevered Star and purchase it on harvard.com and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Have a good night, keep reading, and everyone please stay well. Thank you both so much. Thanks everyone. Yeah, thank you.